as we move on, Mel has come back. Thank you, Mel, for uh, uh, taking us through this whole different uh, set of criteria, new criteria that's being uh, uh, instituted by A.J. Deuce. A.J. Deuce, who just put his paper out earlier this year, just a one or two months ago, uh, uh, and has put it out for people to read. You have gone through it and you're unpacking it section by section. Now, you're coming into an area that you probably don't agree with necessarily, but we need to get it out there so people can understand it. We just had this, we just put up a quick video just to help people realize that much of what we're uh, in, uh, introducing is speculative and it can be quite controversial. Uh, it may not necessarily be acceptable for all of you, but we need to put it out there so that we see the whole picture. And we've got to stick out, stick to uh, the path that A.J. Deuce has gone. So obviously this is, uh, we're on the inscriptions and we're trying to date them and you're going to find some inscriptions that are very, very late. Uh, 16th century inscriptions uh, that seem to completely confront what we've seen earlier. So over to you, Mel. Thanks so much. Uh, tell us and see us, uh, help us walk us through this material and let's see where we go. Let me just share the slides here. Okay, so um, as, as you say, it's this is quite controversial, but this is A.J. Juice's explanation for why they would put inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock in the 16th century. Um, so finally, in the 16th century, some evidence of the mosaics as they exist today. So if you imagine for the, the best part of 900 years, there is no evidence, verbal evidence, written evidence, you name it, of any uh, inscriptions and, and particularly anything that would indicate the mosaics that exist today and then all of a sudden there is something that would suggest that um, people have seen the, the mosaics and are um, emulating it in um, a picture. So, oh, it's gone frozen, there we go. A pilgrimage certificate from 1544 to 45 shows a layout of the Haram al-Sharif with the Dome of the Rock covering the foundation stone. Despite the artistic difference in hue, the relationship between the extant mosaics and the art and the drawing appears to be apparent. So he's saying that, okay, the colors may not be the same, but there is a strong similarity between what's there and what's found in the Dome of the Rock. There's a kind of a um, very strong similarity in design, um, which we don't find before this time. And he suggests that the reason why this pilgrimage certificate was created was because the mosaics were recently produced prior to that earlier in the 16th century. He says that it, it seems to be the interior of the dome or a composite. If this is what it appears to be, then we look at a first representation of the interior mosaics on the inner octagonal. Despite the artistic difference in hue, the relationship between the extant mosaics and the art on the drawing appears to be apparent. That this first shows up here cannot be an accident. While the mosaics have never been mentioned before in any recognizable form, they probably existed in the year 1544 as a template for an artistic pilgrimage certificate. So he's basically saying that what was in the Dome of the Rock was used as a template for this pilgrimage certificate. So this is evidence for the existence of the mosaics, at least at that stage. So it's very late. Uh, considering that many people have believed that the mosaics existed all the way through the previous 900 years without anyone mentioning them or doing something like this, which is to uh, mimic the style in a drawing. Next, A.J. Deuce outlines what he believes led to the polemical inscriptions that focus mostly upon Jesus. So this is the, the, uh, the, the part of his uh, paper, which is controversial, it's speculative, um, and I, I don't have any strong opinion one way or the other on this one. Um, I'll share what AJ Juice has said as best I understand it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that we would need to delve into to, to see if it holds water or not. So what he tells us is that Suleiman named his son Mahmed, the Turkish form of Muhammad. This was not merely fate. According to apocalyptic Ottoman beliefs at the time, a young man by the name of Muhammad would be ruler during end times. 
His true objective was to capture Rome and all the lands of the blonde peoples in a holy war, meaning the realms of Constantinople, Vienna and Rome proper. Although this belief had been used to legitimize an earlier Ottoman ruler, Suleiman renewed the projection of apocalyptic prophecy not only onto his son, but also onto himself. He styled himself as the new Solomon. Such a claim should not only alarm every Muslim for its apparent heretical stance, but also every researcher in the field. The apocalypse constitutes the end of prophecy and a new beginning under a new covenant, which also means a new religion. What was Suleiman trying to pull off? So what he's saying is this is another major epoch in the history of Islam. Whenever there is a, an apocalyptic era, there's usually um, a messiah figure. There's usually an attempt to start a new religion. Um, so presumably when Islam began, it was, it was at the end of a messianic period. And, and again, we have something similar happening. Now, looking at it from the point of view of today, these messianic figures would probably be viewed as heretics, but they were taken seriously at the time. Um, Let, so we should interrupt. What what time are we talking about? What years are, are we? So are we, we're talking about the early part of the 16th century here. Okay, so still for 1500s. Yeah. So um, one of the figures that um, is part of this messianic fervor is a, a guy called David Rubini. Um, A.J. Juice says the second issue is an extraordinary character who steps into history at precisely this moment, David Rubini. According to church records, he is David al-Nazarani Abbasiye, the Hebrew king of Ethiopia, David II of the Solomonic dynasty. The Pope gets to know him as David and Prester John, not as a Jewish messiah, Rubini. He's the forerunner to Shlomo Molko, the two forming a messianic pair. Rubini arrives in Jerusalem in 1523. In a conversation that takes place in Gaza, he announced his messianic mission. The end of the world is near. The evil ones would be brought down to earth and Jews would be uplifted. War would come between the world powers. Now, of course, looking at it from our uh, perspective in the 21st century, all of this seems just crazy stuff. But people like that emerge almost every century and they, they get a following for a time. Um, he goes on to say that Rubini introduces himself to the guards of the Temple Mount as the son of Prophet Muhammad and the new Lord of the Muslims. Of course, since any Messiah must be from a branch of the houses of David or Joseph, Rubini and Prophet Muhammad must have been in one of the two houses. The 70 elders also come to Jerusalem to join the preparations for the end of the world and for the sack of the temple. They reinstate the Sanhedrin. Now, again, this is A.J. Deuce's um, point here, not mine. I have no opinion one way or the other, but let's just go with it and, and see where it takes us. Now, um, at this junction, a scholar by the name of Mola Capis appears in Constantinople an obvious nickname of contempt. The scholar merely fits a rabbinic pattern where Capi stands for the lineage of King David and Mala for a messianic figure. In a near contemporary history, he is called Mulkarabum, Mulka the Arab, whom I've already introduced. Now it was interesting, I was trying to find out more about this character, Mala Capi, and there are uh, movies about him, which are in Arabic and other languages. So he's obviously, a very important figure, but unfortunately, I couldn't understand what it was saying in English. So if anyone's an Arabic speaker and manages to, to take the time to um, look at that movie, it'd be interesting to hear what the full story of this guy is and see where it all fits in. This man is highly esteemed in Constantinople as the prophet of Damascus, and he is promoted by the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha, Suleiman's right hand. Since the recent converts from Orthodox Christianity to Sunni Islam are open to new ideas, he proposes a new religion where Jesus enjoyed supremacy over Prophet Muhammad and all other prophets. Mala Kapis's proposal is the apparent result of a fusion of Byzantine and Islamic apocalyptic uh, thinking. Now, so he's basically placing um, Jesus above Muhammad 
Now, can you imagine how that um, proposal would have gone down with um, many Muslims at the time? They wouldn't. They wouldn't have been too happy about it. No. Um, and so, therefore, someone needed to respond and basically destroy his argument and um, basically revert things back to the way they were. And so what A.J. Juice suggests is that the rock inscription is an attempt to um, counter this hybrid religious view. It's got elements of Judaism, it's got elements of Christianity and Islam. It's, it's a very dangerous idea. They obviously want to um, counter the theological argument. Um, and so A.J. Juice suggests that the rock inscription is there to basically take each one of, of Malo Kapisa's arguments and destroy them. That's the idea behind it. Uh, I won't read all of this. I'll just give you the top part. A.J. Juice says, as I've shown with the inscriptions in Islam, Muhammad is merely the prophet, while the Quran singles out Jesus as the Messiah with a hotline to his God. Jesus is the Christ Messiah of Christianity and of Islam. The Quran puts the word of God on Jesus Christ through his mother the Virgin Mary, and on Prophet Muhammad after the day of Hunayn. So essentially, the reason why this guy's ideas were so dangerous is because you could actually make a very strong argument using the Quran that Jesus is greater than Muhammad. So obviously they were panicked. They needed to strongly condemn this. Um, and the only way to do that would be to put a, you know, a 20 meter inscription to basically get things back to, to the way they were. Um, the standard Islamic narrative defies the Quran itself. If you read the Quran without knowing the standard Islamic narrative, the figure that jumps out at you as being the most important is clearly Jesus. But because of the standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad is placed above Jesus. But Muhammad is only mentioned four times, whereas Jesus is mentioned multiple times and has multiple titles, and he's clearly referred to as the word of God. So a much higher status yeah, than just, merely a prophet. Let me just jump in here. This is something yeah. we have used even in our own ministry. When you look at the person of Issa versus Muhammad, even if you say all these references to the prophet of God, the Nabi, the Rasul of God is Muhammad, because it, Beyond those four times, there are many references that Muslims put in parentheses, Muhammad. If you just look at those many references to this prophet and compare it with Issa, Issa comes out heads and shoulders above. Only Issa is born of a virgin in chapter 19, verse 20. Only Issa is able to speak as, a, as an infant from the cradle in chapter 3, verse 46. Only Issa is able to create birds out of clay, blow on them, and they fly up into the air, create out of nothing, heal the sick, uh, give sight to the blind, and resuscitate the dead. Only Issa in chapter 3, verse 49. And only Issa is the perfect one, the sinless one, the righteous one in chapter 19, verse 19. So can you see, this is actually a really difficult problem for Muslims even today. It, with the Quran as it stands, Jesus is way above anything else, anybody else <clears throat> there in the Quran. So I can see well, what Molo Kabiz is doing here. If he brings up and puts Jesus up above him, you've got to have a re you've got to have some type of response. Uh, it looks like this inscription may be that response. Yep. So um, this is what, what he goes on to say, together with the proposal for a new religion, this puts Molo Kabiz solidly into messianic territory. We do not have enough information about this Malo Mulkarabum, but his death was likely an invention on the path to messianic immortality. But what we do have is the element that is sticking out from the inscriptions, the simultaneous diminishing and lifting of Jesus, not to a higher level, but to the same level as Prophet Muhammad, an apparent compromise between Mulkarabum's proposal and the Ottoman naysayers. So in other words, it's an attempt to reconcile both sides, to avoid a split at this most important time when they're trying to conquer the West. The last thing they need is the this two sides of the camp to be split. So this is a compromised position. It is said that Malo's positions have never been ref refuted by Muslim scholars, but the clarification, the refutation, hangs on the inner octagonal of the Dome of the Rock. So it's I think it's it's got a lot going for it. Um, 
AJ Juice goes on to say the Moloch of Peace appears to be Jewish. Um, therefore, AJ Juice is suggesting that the inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock are not addressing Christianity, but addressing the position of a heretical Jew with messianic pretensions. It is intended to refute his theology. Now, what I found interesting is the fact that Red Judaism recently on a video of yours, um, a, a video of his, um, was suggesting that the inscriptions were addressed to a Jewish audience. I think he might be onto something there. It does seem to be talking about Christianity, but it does more specifically seem to be addressing a Jewish audience in particular. Um, and that's what I've just said there. Um, a 1528 AD inscription prays for Suleiman. And that's interesting that that is there in the Dome of the Rock, which fits in with this. The windows up high in the dome are decorated with a long inscription that prays for Suleiman and is dated to 1528. If authentic, then internal and external renovations must be ongoing during the Sanhedrin's presence on the Temple Mount. I can't vouch for the veracity of A.J. Juice's claim that the Sanhedrin were present on the Temple Mount, but I do think it's interesting that there was an inscription definitely put there in 1528 to do with Solomon and, and praying for him. And if the other inscriptions were put there at the same time, that would make a lot of sense. Um, in 1543, Suleiman's son Mahmed dies. This marks the point from which the Muslim caliph turns towards in, inwards to spirituality. For whichever reason, the Sanhedrin is said to have moved from Jerusalem to Safed sometime around 1542 AD, but more likely after Mahmed's unexpected end. It would have given them two decades from 1523 to 1543 for extensive interior renovations of the Dome of the Rock, which he would suggest was when many of the mosaics and uh, inscriptions were put there. And immediately thereafter, we have that pilgrimage certificate from 1544-1545. From 1545 to 66 AD, the Dome of the Rock undergoes significant restorations during which today's exterior mosaics are attached in a mixture of Mamluk traditions and Ottoman ceramic techniques. During these renovations, the mosaics on the drum are allegedly replaced with glazed tiles. On the one hand, this is credible. On the other, uh, the drum is still octagonal. Hence, we may discuss evidence that no longer exists. So he says basically that whatever work that was done on the drum doesn't matter because the drum that's there now is circular. Back in those days, it was octagonal. So all of that, it, that um, mosaic work on the, the interior drum is not, would um, have been taken down when they changed the, the drum. Um, we also have these additional details that kind of add to A.J. Deuce's case. The Mausoleum of Suleiman um, from 1566 is inspired by the Dome of the Rock, um, as if the ruler intended to be laying to rest in the center of the world. And when we look at a comparison between the uh, mosaics within that mausoleum with that of what's in the, the Dome of the Rock, there's an inescapable similarity between the styles of both. The intricate decoration in Suleiman's mausoleum is geometrical. The closest that its designs get to an embedded message is a turban-like crown that is designed into the tiles over doorways adjacent to the mirab. If the mosaics in the Dome of the Rock and the tiles in Suleiman's mausoleum are from the same period, then the difference is that the latter is of contemporary concern, while the former pretends to be of ancient origin. So that's, I, I think when you look at the two, you can see it's a very similar uh, style um, and seem to be from the same era. And also, if, if we look at uh, the tomb of Salim II, which is around this similar period, this is different from, uh, sorry, this is different with exterior tile work at the tomb of Salim II. Here we have a direct stylistic relationship to the figures in the Dome of the Rock. So there is a strong correlation between both designs, and that's where I end that one today.
listen, thank you so much. This is um this is very helpful. What we're trying to do and what you've been doing all the way through, trying to find out and date when these inscriptions, which we have always thought were 692, when they were actually written. I, I actually what I find find is fascinating, rather than get into the whole internecine problem of what was happening politically and what was happening theologically on the ground. Because that really, you, it's neither here or there. You're, you're not there. We can't say, well, how much of that influenced what, was, what that inscription is. Uh, whether or not the, because of this elevation of Jesus over Muhammad at this point is why that inscription was written. What I think is more, I mean, that could be the reason that's written. But what I think is much more striking is what you said right towards the end there. And that is when you look at the structure itself from an octagonal dome, which is very clear there in the, uh, we, we're talking about the 16th century, 1500s, and you compare it with the Suleiman's mausoleum, which is 1566, almost identical, and that, and it's similar to also the tomb of Selim the, the second. Those, that, that's what you do when you want to uh, do, uh, when you're looking for archaeology, when you're looking for art, when you're looking for dating of structure. We do this with the manuscripts. You date the manuscripts by the type of, of images that are on those manuscripts that are uh, parallel buildings that come from a period. You can, you know, the dates of the buildings. We know the dates here, 1566. And you also know what kind of artistry is on that building. And if they are, they parallel each other, that would suggest, therefore, that that's the time period that these uh, mosaics, which are on the arches above which is the inscriptions, the inscriptions cannot exist without the arches holding them up. If you, um, before we move on, Mel, what part of the Dome of the Rock are you talking about? Are you talking about the drum, which is circular today, or are you talking about the arcades, which are octagonal today? Where are these inscriptions that we're referring? Could you just put an image up there and I'll pause yeah. it right now just to be, so we can get to it. But can you put an image and explain so what we don't get confused as to what we're referring to when we're talking about this large inscription that we're suggesting was created in the 1500s, not the 7th century. What are we talking about so that this won't, if it confuses me, I'm sure it'll confuse our audience. Okay, so if you imagine the... Uh, a bird's eye view of the Dome of the Rock, you have the outside wall, and then you have an octagonal arcade, which is yeah, a good bit in from it, okay? On either side of that wall is where the inscriptions are. Okay, I'm just um, and so the picture up here. Look where the green arrows are pointing. This is the arcade that we're talking about. And there's inner, here's the one uh, arrow, there's the inner, and then there's the outer, here's the other arrow. So look yeah. at the, that's what you're talking about. So you're not talking yeah. about the drum. You're not talking about what we used to call the inner ambulatory. Yeah. You're talking about the outer ambulatory. Yeah. So if you were walking around the, the drum, you, if there was inscriptions inside the drum, you would not be able to see them because the, there's too much block in your, your view. Whereas if you look up, let's say if you're going clockwise around, you look up to your left, you'll see them. Um, so the, the drum, which holds up the do dome itself, that's irrelevant to what we need to concern ourselves. It's further out from the center. That's where the inscriptions are. Yeah, and that's where are. the mosaics are. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Uh, this is interesting because what you're you're really trying to nail down the date. You're really trying to nail down the date when these inscriptions, and you're saying what's happening on the ground will suggest what's going on. If you have this guy uh, Melakabis who is elevating Jesus above Muhammad, there has to be a reaction. There has to be a response to it, which would, according to Dios, it would there stand to reason that that's why we're seeing all these responses. Say not three, for God is one, and he has no son. That's a response to that. That comes from chapter 4, verse 171 today. Truly, he is neither begets nor is he begotten. Uh, that would be an also response to uh, a, this elevation of, of Jesus. And that's found in Surah 112 today in the Quran. And then, of course, the Shahada itself is introduced. If you're saying that he is not this, he's not this, he's not this, God is only one. And this Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. He's not these things. He is a messenger, nothing more than a messenger. That then brings down this deification of yeah. Jesus or elevation of Jesus down yeah. to his humanity, even less than Muhammad. Yeah. So it's really saying the two that count is Allah and Muhammad, the prophet. The, the Muhammad of this sin is what really matters. Yes, this Jesus guy is important, blah, 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 blah. 
but he's not above our Muhammad of the sin. That's what they were trying to argue, according to how I understand A.J. Jesus' okay. uh, case there. No, could be, well be. Well, we're not going to stick to take a position on this, but we've got to put it out there. Uh, the rest of you, come back, see what you say. You may agree, you may disagree. Thanks so much, Mel, for coming and helping us out. We'll go on to the next chapter where we're going from uh, section to section, looking and seeing where the evolution of this building took place, when these inscriptions were actually introduced, and what was the discussion that was happening that we see through these inscriptions at that time, that place with, with those people. God bless you. Good to see you again. Mel and Jay, over and out. Mm -hmm.